This is uh, our new publication that is on the way to Cuba. Cuba. And um, para la venta means not for sale. This is necessary because you have to cross customs in various countries and if they think you're making money out of it or getting money from it, we're going to charge you a tax. So we're hoping and praying that we're going to slip past customs and they're going to say, well, this is free of charge, it's not for sale, no money being made. We pray. That's something we can pray about. Uh, this is uh, Steps to Christ by any other title. And Biscanda La Paz, Finding Peace Within, is what this is all about. And there are 20 complete Bible studies along with the full text of Steps to Christ. I think you know that, but if you don't, this is a, this is a witnessing publication, both spiritually and doctrinally. And uh, I'm really thankful to get these on the road, and we got to pray that uh, they are distributed, yes. Spanish, that's Spanish, to Cuba. And I'm not going to elaborate on this about why there seems to be some dodging about specifics. Let's just say it was necessary to dodge some specifics, okay? They're on their way, and here we have a picture of 10 pallets of Biscanda La Paz, and these can be distributed literally to the whole country of Cuba. They're on their way. Here we are praising God right now that the books for Cuba are on their way. After almost a year of planning, development, and fundraising, the books are finally out the door, loaded, and bound for the ships. Ship. Now, uh, Tony, they went from here to Savannah, Georgia? Yes, they went from here to Atlanta, picked up a train, and then went out to Savannah. Oh, they went to Atlanta by truck, and then went on train to Savannah yeah. to be put on a boat. Yeah. Man, what you got to do to get anything uh, done these days. 65,000 copies of Biscanda La Paz Interior, that Steps to Christ with 20 Bible studies, especially developed for the Cuban Union, have begun their journey to the Caribbean. Shipping along with the books are 65,000 small evangelistic tracts, a love letter from Jesus in Spanish, which were donated by a soldier of Christ with a heart for the Cuban people. We're grateful beyond words for your help so far with this project. Your continued prayers are urged as we anticipate Con the continued path these books must take before they get into the hands of our Cuban brothers and sisters. To the left, in the photograph here, to the left is the book which has been prepared for the Cuban Union. It has all the addresses and phone numbers pertinent to the evangelism on the island. In other words, if someone receives this book in Cuba, it doesn't say Jemison, Alabama. You understand? They're not writing to us. That would not be the right thing to do in many ways. So we have given the address of how many different uh, locations? Five separate locations in Cuba that they can write to, which represent the organized bodies of the church. This book has all the addresses and phone numbers pertinent to evangelism on the island. On the top right of the book, the words no para la venta indicate the book is not for sale. The book is a gift to the Cuban people to be freely distributed. Now what we're going to do, the idea with distributing the books once they get there, is to give 32,000, listen, 32,000 Cuban Seventh-day Adventist church members two copies, one for themselves and their family, and one to share for witnessing. I think that's a grand strategy. Um, many times the people in these countries that we go to, the Adventists in these countries, they don't have the books themselves. And so it's our way of meeting a, a double obligation here, witnessing to the members of the church, giving them encouragement to share a copy with a friend. And these 32,000 Adventist Christians are scattered all over Cuba, aren't they? Ah, wonderful, wonderful. To be given to the Cuban people will be freely distributed. Once the books get on the ground, they must go through the regular process of clearing customs, 
and being delivered to the Union facility in, facility in Havana. We're not sure exactly how these books will be treated by Cuban Customs. The books are a gift, so shouldn't be subject to taxes or duties. But when you get to poor countries, they like to tax. Okay? We hope that's not the case, and God will help us get through without having to raise more funds. The books are a gift. Shouldn't be subject to taxes or duties. But this is the first time such a large gift has been made to any church on the island. You hear that? This is a historic event to any church on the island. So we don't know what to expect. Maybe no charges at all. We'll see. Once the books clear customs, they must be moved on. Without giving too many details, we'll just say there will be fuel and sundry expenses. Your faith in us and your financial help with the continuation of the project will be greatly appreciated. Below is the donation button. Now this is uh, the age in which we're living. Below is the donate button. This is the button that lets you get involved with the mission without getting involved with the misery. Amen to that. Those of you who have sacrificed your time and energy in a cause far from home in a part of the planet without the luxury of home will appreciate the donate button. Cuba is such a place without any of those luxuries. Thank you for your continued prayers and support. Keep it up. Now this is going out by email, and is it going out by mail? Mail. Uh, email so far. Okay. This is a miracle in the making. It's been making for a year already. And I'm just praying the next 30 to 60 days we'll see these arrive and get out and start going. You need to pray that too. There are always obstacles. If you have been in the Lord's work at all, there are always obstacles. There's a group of bad guys who are working behind the scenes to always obstruct the way. And uh, prayer is what keeps us going. I think most of you know that I've been traveling and speaking on prophecy for uh, 38 to 40 years now, more than half my life given to a ministry of sharing Bible prophecy. And along the way, I have, uh, I've had persons, lay persons, and minister persons um, kind of call me to task. And uh, say things like, uh, why don't you preach Jesus? As though what you're sharing has nothing to do with the good news of Jesus. Um, you never preach on the cross. You, well, anyhow, I want to get some response from you, not about me, but ask you if you understand that in the list of gifts of the Holy Spirit that are given to us in the New Testament, one of those is the sharing or the giving or the interest in Bible prophecy. Do you understand that this can be a gift of the Spirit? And so I would wonder if you could understand, here, here, here I put it, I wonder if you could understand and appreciate a simple paragraph here that was written 150 years ago. It's from the pen of Ellen White, 150 years ago. She wrote it as though it were taking place in her day, but 150 years ago. Her day has come and gone. A storm is coming, relentless in its fury, thinking men and women, thinking persons, have their attention fixed upon the events taking place about us. Well, how would a thinking person have their attention fixed upon the events taking place about us? Would you think they might be watching the news? Do you think they might be following the news of the day? They're watching the relations that exist among the nations. Uh, maybe some people would be interested in a possible war between the United States and North Korea that's brewing. Or a possible war between the United States and Iran that is brewing. 
They're watching the relations that exist among the nations. They observe the intensity taking possession of every earthly element. So what, what intensity do we see taking possession of every earthly element? When the news comes on, whether it's in Spain or Russia or people are demonstrating by the thousands, even the millions, they're yelling, they're screaming, they're waving their placards, they're throwing rocks and gas bottles at the police, they're um, they observe the intensity taking possession of every earthly element and they recognize that something great and decisive that's where we want to focus this morning something great and something is the, there is a battle that is brewing there is a crisis that is ahead if we could just read the signs of the times Jesus said you would understand they recognize that something great and decisive is about to take place, that the world is on the verge, hasn't arrived yet. It's on the verge of a stupendous crisis. Now this was written 150 years ago. That word stupendous was not used very often 150 years ago. On the verge of a stupendous crisis. What, what would you, what would you, Think, what picture would a stupendous crisis bring to mind? Is that a natural disaster? Could be. I mean, we've just evidenced one hurricane and another hurricane and another hurricane, and it looks like the fourth one is brewing now, and they are all aiming for the same part of the world. Is this unusual? Is this? Yes, it is. It's so unusual, the weather people and the historians are saying, this is unusual. We've not seen anything line up this way. Now, if you don't understand what a hurricane means, if it just passes over you and passes through your area where you live one time, it's going to weaken. Some places it's going to blow to pieces. Some places it's going to weaken. But then two or three weeks later, here comes another hurricane following exactly the same course. And all those buildings and all those houses and all those, all those that were weakened the first time, what happens the second time around? Especially when you are the bullseye. So what are they saying about Puerto Rico? Why don't, why don't we take a moment? What are they saying about Puerto Rico? How about a modern term like, it's a shambles. It's torn to pieces. It was hit and then hit again by an even stronger storm. Now these people are humble people. We've been to Puerto Rico several times. These are humble people. They don't live in $300,000 homes, most of them. They live in, you have to remember, they don't get snow and they don't get ice and they don't get frigid weather and they don't get, so they just put board or tin between themselves and the out of doors and that's how that's your house well a hurricane just is a hurricane and not only that the essential services were damaged to the point that there was no running water in 90 plus percent of the country do you understand that and as these people trying to follow up and get into these remote parts of Puerto Rico are getting there, they're finding people drinking sewage water because they don't have anything to burn a fire or stove and boil the water. And there's been two weeks and three weeks now and they have to have water to drink, so they're drinking sewage water. Well, I don't, I don't want to belabor the point but there is something unusual taking place. The whole world is watching what's taking place and saying. There are voices around the world that are saying, boy, God must be mad with those people. God must be angry with those people. Those people meaning the United States of America. Well, how is the United States of America being affected by Puerto Rico being uh, turned to a shambles? Come on, tell me. They are a U.S. territory. And in recent months, while they were trying to get their own government standing on their own legs, it was determined that they couldn't pay their debts. And so 73 to 75 
billion dollars. Billion dollars. We're talking about a little island country. $75 billion that needs to be paid, and they couldn't pay it. So they are in literally in a state of bankruptcy. And then the country is hit and hit again, and how many billion dollars worth of damage has been done? So if you heard President Trump in recent days, he said uh, uh, Puerto Rico is in trouble. They can't pay their way out of this. So who pays? Who pays? Come on, together, we pays. Who pays? We pays. Well, we're just flush with money in this country. I'm so glad uh, the $75 billion, that's just a drop in the bucket, and the $30 plus billion more, the damage that has been wrought, $100 billion. What's $100 billion? Especially when you've done $100 plus billion in Texas and another 40 to $50 billion in Florida. Are you listening? And now here we are aiming at Chilton County, Alabama. People call and they say, Oh, Brother Wheeling, is the storm going to hit you? No, the storm's not going to hit us. It's bypassed us there and bypassed us there. No, 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 no. Does it appear to any of you that there seems to be an intelligence driving these things? In great controversy, you'll find statements saying that it's through the natural elements that Satan is going to make war at the end. Satan is going to make war at the end. At the end. Um, 35, 40 years ago when I first began uh, traveling and speaking, it was a very unusual thing for a speaker to come into Seventh-day Adventist churches, especially outside of the South, the conservative South. It was a very unusual thing for somebody to get in the pulpit on Sabbath and start reading quotations from the Spirit of Prophecy. It was a very unusual thing. You might get an occasional quote in the Sabbath school quarterly, but it was unusual. And I introduced myself to the people in those meetings over and over and over again with uh, a few quotations from Testimonies to Ministers. I said, you don't have this book because it says Testimonies to Ministers, and I know you didn't buy it, so I'm, I feel obligated to share some of these things with you. And uh, here is a reading in Testimonies to Ministers, the study of the books of Daniel and the Revelation. Now, I didn't write that headline. I didn't write these quotes, but I was taking full advantage of them because I knew they were guided and given through the Holy Spirit. I still believe they are. And I want to share just, just, just a few of these quotations. They're pertinent, which means they're timely. They have some application, but this was written 150 years ago. And so I want to ask you, what's wrong with a prophet who writes that it's happening right now, but 150 years late? Well, when was the book of Daniel written? 600 years before Christ. So if Daniel applies to our day, Daniel missed it by 2,600 years. You remember he kept asking, what does this mean and when will these things be? Finally, the angel said, it's none of your business. It's not for you. It's for. When the shaking comes, whatever the shaking means, when the shaking comes by the introduction of false theories, surface readers anchored nowhere are like shifting sand. I don't know how many times I have been confronted with uh, Seventh-day Adventists who want to get right in my face and say, Shaking comes introduction of false theories. That's you. But uh, he goes on to read, she says, uh, when you are presented with new light, 
Don't just guess. Study to see. Examine. There's a need, a need of much closer study of the Word of God, especially should Daniel and the Revelation have attention as never before in the history of our work. Now this is 150 years ago. Adventism was new. Adventism was young. Attention as never before in the history of our work. The light Daniel received from God was given especially when I when Tony puts this on the screen for me next time we're going to take the word especially and we're going to especially for these last days the visions he saw by the banks of the Uli and the Hittikel the Uli and the Hittikel the great rivers of Shinar are now in process of fulfillment and all the events foretold will soon come to pass I have to take a moment right here to make this pertinent to you. We're between bodies of water here. Historically, this has been referred to as the land between the seas, right here. This is the Persian Gulf, very much in the news in the last 20, 30 years. And this is the easternmost extremity of the Mediterranean Sea. You should recognize this little country state right here. It's about 50 miles wide at the widest point and 90 miles tall, and that's Israel. That's the Holy Land. That's the Bible Land. That's where the Bible and Jesus and all of these events that we talk about and claim are inspired, this is where they originated, right here, right here. This is Israel. Uh, this is, um, I want to say Beirut, Lebanon. And this is Jordan. And uh, this is Syria. This is uh, Saudi Arabia. I know you're perfectly familiar and acquainted with all of this geography, but uh, this is Iraq. You can recognize Iraq if you know anything about your geography at all, because it's shaped like a, a piece of pie right here. And uh, there's so much written about the area we call Iraq in modern times, in the Bible. For example, when the Babylonians came across to Israel and broke down the walls of Jerusalem and tore the temple down, which temple were they warring against? Which temple? Come on, the glorious temple. Who built it? Solomon's glorious temple. The Babylonians came this way because that's where the water and the green grass was for their animals. This is desert. This is very important. You begin to get some pictures, formulate some pictures in your thinking of what's going on here. This is Iraq. What is this? Come on. I could say Persia. I could say the Medes and the Persians. I could by whatever. Now, these bodies of water are historic and very biblical. The Tigris and the Euphrates. Why are they so important in ancient history, ancient biblical texts? Right on back into Genesis. Because the Garden of the Garden of the Garden of Eden was located over here. That's what we believe, and we have good reason to believe that the Garden of Eden was here. And these rivers once flowed out of the Garden of Eden. The Tigris and the Euphrates are very famous historically. It's another study and discussion about how, if the rivers were here, how could they get there? 
Well, once upon a time in the Bible, it talks about in the days of Peleg was the earth what? Come on, in the days of Peleg was the earth divided. This used to be there. That's another story. These two rivers flow out of the mountains of Iraq and up here is, uh, it'll come to me. And there's a third river that I want you to see here and it is on your map. So look at the Persian Gulf down here in the lower right hand corner of this map that I have put into your hands. And I want you to see Babylonia. This is Babylonia. And I want you to see the two rivers. There's the Tigris and there's the Euphrates. Can you find them? I want you to find them, see them. And they come somewhat near together where Baghdad is located. Baghdad was the capital, ancient capital city of Babylon. And why would it be placed right there? Because these great rivers that watered the entire country we're coming close together there. And if you can control the river traffic, you control the country. You listening? Now they're flowing southeastward. Follow these two rivers where they come together. Where they come together. And then I want you to look at a third river that is listed there, shown as a little thin blue line over here. And it is... Uh, called the Karun, K-A-R-U-N. Can you see that? The Karun River is the modern name for the Ulai. So here's Ellen White, 150 plus years ago, writing about the time of the end. And she says, this river, Ulai, is going to have a prominent role to play. The Ulai and the Hidekel. Now, follow me on the board. These are not wasted words. This is not wasted information. Depending on how far you want to go with your homework, the Tigris River that flows all the way through the country here and down and merges right here with the uh, Euphrates, this entire span or length of the river, Tigris River, could be referred to historically as the Hittichel. Now, not all the historians are agreed on this point. I want to bring this to your attention because I believe this is more correct than the whole river being representing the Hittichel. Some believe, as I do, that the Hittichel is where the two great rivers have merged their waters and are now flowing toward the greater body of water, the, the Persian Gulf, we call it, and is flowing past Basra. I don't think Basra shows on that map, does it? I want you to make a mental note. That means get it in the memory bank. Don't let it go in one ear and out the other. This is Basra. This is a second capital city to the modern nations of Iraq and before that, the Medes, the Persians, and whatever and whatever. How can a country have two capital cities? Basra is a second capital city because this nation that we call modern Iran, and it is modern by that name, is really separated into two parts, the south and eastern part, and then the rest of the country. It, what, what separates it? What always separates people is religion. Religion. These represent Shia Islam. These represent another branch, another sect of Islam. Somebody help me. What's the other sect called? Sunni. Sunni. Islam. Now, people in church are always sweet people. They're always loving and kind. And so, if these people are Muslims, and these people are Muslims, they should love one another. Yes? I said they should love one another. Yes? Yes. 
But there's an ancient prophecy in the Bible that says of the birth and the rise of these peoples that they will hate one another and can't get along with themselves or with the neighboring countries round about. And so these are historic hatreds. And this is how Basra became a capital city because 70% of the population of modern Iraq is Shia. But they're confined to this little 20, 30%, 25% of the country down here because we hate you and you hate us. Now why is this important? Well, we shall see. This is Basra. I want you to take note with me that Basra is on the Hidakel. On the Hidakel. And it is slightly south of the merging waters of the Ulai. Or the Karun would be a modern name. The waters are merging. Now this is, uh, this is about to become very important for you to understand a little bit about geography. Know a whole lot about geography. If this were the strength of Shia, this was 80% of Shia and this was 20% of Shia, then the strength is always going to want to take the ascendancy. Always want the upper hand. You listening? And so if you were over here and you wanted to take over this whole country right here and get rid of all of those folk that we don't like, uh, would you come across here with your armies? Would you come across here with your armies? Or would you come across the single body of water? One time to get across the water. One time. Because here you got across and you got across and... This is the focal point. And by the way, this little lady with three grades of education, she hit it right 150 plus years ago. She said, when this time comes, the Ulai and the Hidakel will become the focal point. I've tried to share that with thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of Adventist Christians saying, you need to understand what is being said here. You don't know about the Uli, you don't know about the Hittichel, you need to find out. You need to understand that this is very much a part of the prophetic information, light from heaven, given for the last days. So I posed the question before, what do you say to a person that says, uh, you're preaching about the Uli and the Hittichel, that has nothing to do with Jesus? How would you answer? That's how you answer. Say nothing. Either the Holy Spirit is going to find common ground in the thinking of people, or it has nothing to do with heaven. You can sit there and try and force feed people, but either they are open and receptive and willing to examine and question, or they're shut off, hard-headed, hard, stone-cold, hard-headed. I've seen this for years and years and years. But I have also seen people come to more than one seminar. Oh, now that makes sense. Oh, now I see. Oh. See, light is progressive. That's how we can take Ellen White as a prophet 150 plus years ago. And she wrote about it and said, it's right now. It's right now. There's going to be a change in the circulating currency. This is for the last days. This is the work of the devil. This is. And so... For 150 years, she's been mistaken. Are you listening? And people come to me, well, Brother Wheeling, you talked about this 40 years ago. When's it going to happen? Maybe another 150 years. But maybe not another 150 years. We don't know. Jesus said you don't know until you see the signs of the times. That's that quote we read here. They're watching with intense interest the relations that exist between the nations. 
Does God use prophecy to explain the plan of salvation? To enlighten, to enlarge upon the plan of salvation? Come on. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I have never been ashamed of saying, let's talk prophecy. Let's discuss prophecy. Let's see what is ahead so we can recognize it as a people, as individuals, when these events come to pass. It's been a strange uh, experience, this uh, traveling so widely for so long and speaking to so many hundreds of thousands of different minds. I mean, it was in Canada, way over in Eastern Canada. I was in Australia, way over in Western Australia and Eastern Australia and Northern Australia and Southern Australia. It's, it's a strange journey. You speak to hundreds of thousands of people. Some of them you'll see only once, but you pray you're leaving something there that will register when the time comes. Hey, they call up Brother Wheeling. Hadn't talked to you in 30 years, Brother Wheeling. Everything you said is coming to pass. No, it's not what I said. It's what the Bible says is coming to pass. And it's been difficult to wait 30 or 40 years on it. Difficult for me, difficult for them. But now we begin to see things taking place, taking shape. And Jesus said, a wise person recognizes the signs of the, come on, signs of the times. This is where I believe we are. So I want to take a moment and uh, reinforce what we've been saying. Now I have plagued poor Tony to death, near death. Robert, one per family, please. And we've been sharing this with you, but I'm going to bring you up to date because the first month on here is October. And I think we're in the month of October. Aren't we in October? Yeah. Yeah, by a few days. And so we have to pick up the pieces right here. According to this guesswork... We have only three, three and a half months left until something critical is going to take place. So I want us to get to October. So when you get this in hand, I want you to find October. And I want you to see that uh, my suggestion is part four, or in here following, is that we focus on Iraq especially Basra. This is October, and I said, better start focusing on Basra. Why? Because Iran, who is very much stronger than Iraq, and very much in control now of Iraq as well as Iran, because we have pushed the Americans out. We have insisted that the Americans leave. And we have only a token force there. But Iran now has, um, by some estimates, 150,000 Iranian soldiers flooded into this part of Iraq, especially Syria, to the north. You listening? You following? Focus on Iraq, especially Basra. I'm saying to you, beginning as early as October, which month we are in, there may be news items appearing that are going to incidentally speak of Basra. Just guesswork on my part. But I know it's coming because it's in the book. I know it's coming. The question is, is this the time? Ellen White thought it was 150 years ago. I'm in good company. Watch and listen for the Iraq, Iraqi Shia hothead, Muqtadr al-Sadr. How do I do this? Be as kind as I can. Be as loving as I can. About 1980 and thereabouts, the country of Iran was being seized and taken over by the religious element and uh, someone who had been driven away 
uh, Islamic, a Muslim cleric, a Shia cleric, had been driven out of the country and had been in Great Britain, I believe, for some 20, 30 years. And he was welcomed back to uh, Iran. Anybody remember his name? Well, if you saw his picture, you would remember his name. His name was Khomeini. Khomeini. And you never saw, never saw an image in the news of Khomeini that he was not snarling. He had a look in his eyes, was as demonic as you will ever find. And this man became the spiritual head of Iran. This is the man that said, we're going to take our money and our resources and we're going to make weapons, we're going to make missiles, and we are going to make war on the United States and on Israel and on and on and on. Khomeini. Well, Khomeini had a sidekick, not in Iran, but over in what would be Iraq. And that sidekick was Muqtadr al-Sadr. He was another Shia cleric. He is. He's very much alive. You would have to be acquainted with the current history to know something about Muqtadr al-Sadr. He hated America. He hates America. He was chiefly responsible for pushing the British out of Basra. They were the southernmost contingent in the Iraqi war. He did everything possible, including an insurrection with his troops, to drive the British out of Basra. And when the British picked up and left, then he turned his attention on the Americans in the north and he said, you'll not have peace in this country until every American is gone. Now, effort after effort was made to buy Muqtadr al-Sadr off. If you'll do this, we'll, we'll withdraw, but we'll do so strategically. If you'll just be quiet, not cause trouble, you'll see that we will withdraw. That was the bargain that was struck. Now, it has been the desire and the aim of Muqtadr al-Sadr to put... these two Islamic countries together, including Syria over here, and put this into a, a great modern Muslim state. I forget the word they use for their state government. There is an emphasis on putting these together now, especially since the Iraqi Sunni element. They were called ISIS. You listening? They were referred to as ISIS. They have been driven and bombed and beat back until this part of Iraq and Syria and Iran, they want to now merge into one country, one power, one government one religious element. And so I said for October, um, watch and listen for the Iraqi Sia shot, uh, hothead Muqtadr al-Sadr to appear in the news. That's pure guesswork on my part, but I think it's time for him to break into the news again. We've still got two-thirds of the month of October, and we're moving toward November. Somewhere in here, he's going to be very much in the news again. And then watch for an Iranian military invasion of Iraq crossing the Hidakel. So I want to bring your attention again. The Hidakel, if that's the entire river, Tigris River, or only partial, it doesn't matter. There's going to be an invasion. And I submit to you, the invasion is not going to come up here where they have to cross one body and one body and one body of water. They're going to come where they have to cross one body of water. And it will be at an appropriate time in their year when the waters are low. You listening? 
Now, this is where I want you to pay attention. I can thank uh, who wrote the book Daniel and Revelation? Uriah Smith. This is where I want to thank Uriah Smith for his homework. I had never seen it. It's important. It's sensitive information. Daniel received the vision beside the Uli over here. I was at Shushan in the palace in the province of Elam. And a vision appeared in the night to me, filled my mind. And I saw above the waters of the river a goat pushing. Actually, it says a ram pushing. And a goat from the west came and so Daniel sees in chapter 7 of the book of Daniel, Daniel sees this dream, this vision. And he says, I saw, but I didn't understand what it meant. So I said, oh Lord, what does all of this mean? Now about verse 7 and onward in chapter 7 of Daniel, a pronouncement is made in heaven. Instruction is given to the angel Gabriel. That ought to cause your ears to perk up. Gabriel and the words were these, the command was this, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. He's gotten this information. What does it mean? What is, why am I being waked up in the night and watching all of this and two animals locking horns? What, what does all of this mean? Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. Now about verse 15 through 16 and 17 of chapter 7, this is what Gabriel says to Daniel. Are you listening? Understand, O son of man, that's Daniel. Understand. This vision is at the time of the end. So whatever the ram and the he-goat are all about, they have a belonging to the time of the end. I'm over here at Shushan in the palace, but I saw the man, Gabriel, who appeared to me in vision. And where was Gabriel standing in the vision? At the widening of the Uli. Now if you look at an aerial photograph or a satellite image of the great Mississippi River or any other great river on the, on the planet, you can trace it back. Well, there's just a spring up there in Minnesota or whatever and it starts and it picks up more streams of water and more. Next thing you know, we have the great Mississippi River, one of the largest rivers on the planet. The Mississippi River flows the entire north to south part of our country. And it gets to Louisiana, world famous Louisiana, Robert. Right down there where you used to live. Yeah. The Mississippi River flows down, but when it gets to the area beginning around uh, um, New Orleans, but a little further north, that other, the Atchafalaya breaks off up there, doesn't it? It begins slowing. The waters are flowing quickly. They're moving. They're pushing thousands and even hundreds of thousands of tons of mud a day down the river. It's called the Great Muddy. But something happens when it gets down there around New Orleans and, and uh, that part of Louisiana. The water begins slowing. What is slowing the current? Come on. Widening. The widening. The delta is forming. And the water, instead of flowing in one great river, has to break out into all these branches and tributaries and slows it down and pours its mud and pours and pours. And when it fills that one up, it moves over here and makes another one, a rivulet. This is where Gabriel was standing in the vision, at the widening or the delta of the Uli. And that places everything together to make a picture, to paint a picture. Prediction. That's all it is, a guess, a prediction. As we move toward the end of this year, we're going to see Iran make a bold move to come and join forces with Meqtadr al-Sadr. 
and try to take over the country of Iraq. Try to be dominant, try to be controlling, try to take the rule. Are you listening? Who would object to something like that? Do you think the United Nations would say, we object vociferously, we will not allow this to happen at all? No. Mealy Mouth UN's not going to say it. Say a thing they might say. Well, we disapprove. Iran doesn't care who approves or disapproves. They've demonstrated that a thousand times. Now, let's, uh, let's talk news. For the last two days, for the last 24 to 30 hours, images of the President Trump have appeared on the news and you are saying you are speaking in code you are you why don't you just tell us plainly what is this what is this storm that you're talking about is about to take place why don't you tell us and his response was you'll, you'll see you'll see and this reporter says are you talking about going to war with North Korea we'll see are you talking about disowning the treaty that the previous president of the United States signed agreement with Iran. Are you talking about n making null and void that agreement? We'll see. And all Iran is waiting for, and they've said so in the news, all they're waiting for is the U.S. to back out on this agreement, and they're going to be armed and ready for war. They've said so. And who's afraid of the U.S.A.? Kim Il Sung, Ng, Ong, King Kong, whatever. Um, Rocket Man. Rocket Man, thank you. He just shoots his missiles in the face of the Americans. Do something about it. Why don't you do something about it? Well, I said this three weeks ago before it appeared in the news. I said, I'll tell you why we're not shooting them down just as they're lifting off the pad. Is because the Chinese and the Russians are sitting there with their spy ships to write down the codes of our missiles. Wow. And they're just waiting for us to push the trigger. And they will not only know what the code is to launch the missiles and, and weapons that we're going to use, but they will know which satellites up there are responding so they can shoot our satellites out of the sky. Wow. Oh yes, they can do that. Absolutely, they can do that. Now, I want to remind us, I want to remind us of the words we started with. 150 years ago, they're watching the relations that exist among the nations. They observe the intensity, taking possession of every earthly element. They recognize that something great and decisive is about to take place that the world is on the verge of a stupendous crisis. So I'm going to share this and we're going to close. So we're opening with October and November and we're moving toward December. So this is pure guesswork on my part. I have a timeline that's not guesswork. It's in Daniel chapter 4. 12 months from the, this time to that time. 12 months. And on the day of the 12th month, He's going to say, is not this great America that I have built? Do you understand what's going on here? Because the context of the dream and the vision is at the time of the end. It says so. I want you to look at December. Probable war between the U.S., Britain, Iran, and Iraq. Now I have been sharing that view and the scriptures that present this view for 38 years. I was laughed and scorned when I started presenting them 38 years ago. Along through the years, laugh and scorn. I'm telling you, about December, there's going to be a change of heart and mind. Not to prove that Brother Wheeling is a great foreteller of events. 
but that the Bible is a great foreteller of events. There should be a war, should be a war in the month of December or early January. There should be a war. And something is going to happen according to the visions in Daniel. And when he was strong, that's the rough goat from the West. And when he was strong, when we have used our modern weapons to make fire come down out of heaven in the sight of men, it says. And when he was strong, the notable horn was shattered. That's uh, January 20 of 2018. What happened on January 20 of 2017? Come on. The present president of the United States was inaugurated. And according to Daniel chapter 4, 12 months, 12 months, and he will stand and boast, is not this great America? We told them we were going to do this, and we did it. We warned Kim El Sung, we did it. We warned the Iranians, we did it. Then something happens. According to the vision in Daniel chapter 2 of the great metallic image, the head of gold is going to be reduced in strength, in value, in worth. The vision in chapter 4 says, you're this great tree, but you're going to be cut down. Chapter 7 of Daniel says, uh, you have, you're a lion with eagle's wings, but your wings are going to be clipped and plucked off. Your lion's heart's going to be pulled out and you're going to be to stand, made to stand on your feet like a man. And Daniel chapter 8 says, and when he was strong, when we have met the challenge from here and there, when he was strong, the notable horn was broken, the King James says. You should understand some of the modern readings, modern versions say, the notable horn was shattered broken to pieces, divided into pieces. So we've had a little simple lesson to get started here. We should be able to continue with this next Sabbath. I hope you are taking this in, not for my sake, but for our sake. Because you and I live on this planet and what is coming, the storm that is coming, is going to occupy every square inch of this planet. No one will be able to escape what's coming. No one. And if there's any truth to what we are looking at here, there's going to be seven miserable years that will follow the shattering of the notable horn. Cut the tree down and let seven times pass over it. That's a long time. That's a lot of misery. That's a lot of heartache. And uh, there must be some reason why God has given us this light and this instruction before it comes to pass. Father in heaven, we thank you for the light in your word. We thank you for the light in dark places and darkness of this world. We thank you that we are warned before these things take place so we can make a plan, make provision, make ready. Jesus said, a wise man foreseeth the evil and hides himself. Thank you for blessing us with the light and knowledge of prophecy in your word. I pray that we will understand as these events move along and as they fall into place, I pray that we shall move into our places as well. Thank you for blessing today. Thank you for giving your Holy Spirit through the Word. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.